Welcome to Cybersecurity Today. We're resuming our discussion with Dr. Ron Ross from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, on the topic of system security engineering and cyber resiliency within the context of NIST Special Publication 800-160 Volumes 1 and 2. If you haven't seen the first part of this episode, I suggest you visit our website and watch that episode before you view this one. Welcome back, Dr. Ross. Thanks, Jeff. So Dr. Ross, I think you answered this a little bit in the first part of the episode, but I wanted to ask what level of constructive collaboration has NIST and ISO done to ensure compatibility between the 800-160 and any ISO standards? In other words, are there harmonization between the guidance coming from each respective organization? Can you speak to that for a minute? Sure. Of course, NIST being a standards body, we participate in a lot of the major standards activities going on all around the world. And we always try to defer to the highest level international standards. So if there's already a standard that deals with a certain topic at the ISO level, uh, then we're good to go. We don't do anything additional. Um, sometimes when there's, a, when there's a gap, we'll step in and we'll try to develop a standard, either because it's not covered in the ISO uh, standards world or we need something specific for our country for whatever purpose that uh, would dictate that. Um, our FIPS 140 program, which is pretty famous around the world now, start, that started out as a, a US standard and then eventually we moved that uh, through collaboration into the international standards community. Uh, and I think the, to, to get to the specifics of your question, 8160 volume one, we saw a really, really good standard that the ISO had already, already produced, 15288, but it didn't deal a whole lot with security. So we decided to kind of build out that standard with content in 8160 volume one, with the intent that eventually that content could be contributed to the international standards community and, and potentially be integrated into the 15288 and one of their future updates or possibly even become a separate publication uh, that supports that 15288 publication. So that's the way we typically like to work. There, there's a huge advantage in collaboration in the world of international standards because our industry competes worldwide and you want to be able to have industries that produce goods and services that can be sold globally. And if everybody's doing their own thing on standards, it becomes incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to have products that you can market and sell uh, globally. So that's one of the main reasons why we, we try to collaborate uh, to, with our, our partners around the world. Understood, thank you. So how does the SSE methodology integrate or work with the traditional system development life cycle? Has the SDLC become obsolete with some of this new kind of guidance from 160 volume one and volume two? Actually not, the, the life cycle has been around for a long time and every developmental organization has their own version, but it's pretty much standard across the entire uh, industry. There's the classic, we have 14 different processes in uh, the uh, International Standard 15288. Um, and all of those processes, they start, for example, they start out with, I mentioned earlier, stakeholder requirements. Okay, you have, a, you have an organization, they want to build a system and they need the system to do certain things. So there's a set of requirements that are, that are defined for that system to be able to produce the outcome you need to satisfy the mission owners. And, and so that's where that, at the kind of the left side of that life cycle, it moves through a kind of a sequential, but not always sequential set of steps, which go from the stakeholder requirements and needs, a mission business analysis that precedes that, a set of system requirements, and then right as part of the, the system requirements that are developed, this is where the security engineers come into play there have to be a, a subset of those system requirements are security requirements. So as a stakeholder, you want a system that is gonna have the capability you need, but is also as secure as it needs to be so that capability doesn't get disrupted. And so the, engine, the security engineers will be part of that team and at the requirements definition process, they would be there to say, okay, we need to have these security requirements integrated into your system requirements. So as those, if that, as that system goes through its design, uh, architecture design phases, in integration all the way through, those security requirements will be articulated or built into the architecture, into the design, down to the component level. 
And so that that's how the, the engineering processes are influenced by this security work in 8160. So it's a very compatible process. They, they, in other words, we're, we're kind of just stepping in to that life cycle process and, and we're kind of standing over the shoulders of the system engineers at every step and saying, whispering in there, hey, it'd be good to do this at this point in the life cycle. And if you do that, you're gonna have a system that not only will deliver your mission requirements for the customer, for the stakeholder, but also do so in a way that provides adequate protection. So several years ago, and you alluded to the common criteria, um, that was established to provide a higher level of assurance to government agencies buying commercial off-the-shelf products. I'm curious as to how you envision the SSE that's in 160, does it integrate with the common criteria? Are they parallel tracks? Can, can you speak to that for a moment, just in terms of uh, you know, how, how this stuff might work within you know, the different levels that this common criteria promotes? Sure, the common criteria, and for those of folks who are not familiar with it, it was the one of the first international standards that dealt with um, computer security or information security in a big way. It had three different volumes, and volume one was kind of the overarching model of what you were trying to achieve with the criteria, building products and systems, taking them through evaluation. But the second volume dealt with security requirements. The whole volume two, from end to end, talked about all of the functional security requirements that you could pick from as part of your system development life cycle to achieve the levels of protection you needed. Volume three, which was equally important, dealt with assurance. And a lot of people think assurance is just doing some simple testing at the end of the process, but really it's much more involved than that. When you talk about assurance in the world of development, you're talking about not only how the system is designed the developmental processes that go on to uh, build that software or that system, secure coding techniques, and then the types of testing and evaluation that can go on are they're innumerable. It could be uh, regression testing, penetration testing, static analysis, you know, dynamic analysis. I mean, for those who are not in that business, it can be a very uh, confusing and overwhelming uh, area. But the bottom line is, is that the, the level of assurance in the common criteria really boil down to two things. How good a job did you do to design and to develop the product? And what evidence, again, there's that word evidence, did you bring forward to convince the evaluators that you actually did what you said you were gonna do? And then there's the evaluation, the testing evaluation that goes on many times by independent third-party testing laboratories, looking at evidence, trying to see and verify if you did what you, you said you were gonna do. So all of that type of work is incorporated into 8160 volume one. The security requirements, when you're building a system now, one of the things we recommend, go to the common criteria, volume two. Look at all those security requirements and use those if they're appropriate in the system that you're building. When it comes time to assurance, again, the common criteria has a treasure trove of assurance requirements and evidentiary uh, artifacts that can be brought forward. Again, you can pick and choose from that and bring different sources in. But the basic idea of functional security requirements and assurance is right there in 8160. So it's very compatible. And we're working down that same uh, kind of narrowly focused lane that we started with when, when we started this project. Understood, thank you. I'd like to now kind of talk a little bit about risk management and, and really kind of how SSE integrates for an organization. In your estimation, do they support each other? Or is one the input to the other or vice versa? Or again, are they uh, just different tracks that an organization might, might, might implement to, 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 to really focus on different outcomes? Well, risk management, again, the same term is used in different ways. If you talk to risk management and you go into a, a federal agency or a company, they'll be looking at how much risk do I have if I um, implement the cybersecurity framework and or the uh, risk management framework and I select certain controls and I implement those controls and I assess those controls to see if they're effective and then I, I, I'm asked to make a, a risk-based decision whether that system should go into operation and then I'm going to monitor over time and all of that's I call that an above the waterline view of the risk management process. If you go into an engineering organization and you ask about risk management it's about uncertainty. You know, the stakeholders wanted a, a system 
that's going to accomplish this specific mission. There are certain outcomes that that system has to achieve, and there are certain levels of protection that need to be uh, built into that system to achieve those outcomes in an assured manner. So with that, it becomes uh, about managing uncertainty. But they're not totally uh, different worlds in the sense that we want to have good cyber hygiene above the waterline. We want to have all that risk management by the enterprises. But the big missing component now as we go into the 21st century is what I call the below the waterline uh, view of transparency. You can't make a good risk-based decision unless you have good information. And there's kind of a glass ceiling on the level of information you can get from any risk management process, no matter what it is, the cybersecurity framework, ISO 27000, the NIST RMF. That glass ceiling is, it's only as good as your understanding of what components are actually involved in that system below the waterline. So when we talk about a system stack below the waterline, we're looking at applications, we're looking at middleware, we're looking at operating systems, network devices, the list goes on and on. And we have code libraries that developers are using and there's, there are lots of sources coming in to that ultimate widget that's being built. And we need to know a lot more about what's in that black box individually so as consumers we can make better decisions or engineers can make better decisions on should I select this component or this component. This operating system has 100 million lines of code in it. This operating system has 10 or 12 million lines of code. It's a very narrowly focused OS. It may be much better to have that kind of narrow focus for a weapon system. The more complexity you build into a system, the greater risk there's going to be. That's one of the things that is never going to change as our systems get more complex. And the real danger of not managing your space below the waterline is that vulnerabilities that you know about, and there are literally hundreds and thousands of those kind of vulnerabilities. In fact, we're drowning in known vulnerabilities. Every organization struggles to try to keep ahead of all those and patch their systems. But the real danger is what I call the unknown vulnerabilities. Those are zero day vulnerabilities. That adversaries now, the more complex these systems become, that, that running field becomes open field for the adversaries. You're giving them a lot more opportunity to achieve the mischief they want to achieve. And once they breach your system, then they can establish new vulnerabilities that you didn't have before. They, you know, we've seen this over and over again in some of the more uh, serious vulnerabilities. So that's the reason why we don't want to throw anything out we've done up to this date. Everything above the waterline is great, but we need to double down on the below the waterline engineering activities in order to really round out our overall protection capabilities. That makes sense, thank you. I'd like to also ask about something that I know is near and dear to your heart, at least historically. The federal government has for the past decade or so been focused heavily on continuous monitoring of their systems and their security controls. My question is, does following in your estimation a robust SSE methodology eliminate or reduce the need for government agencies or organizations for that matter to continue to focus so heavily on reviewing their security controls at such a frequent basis? Any thoughts on that? I don't think it ever eliminates that, but I would use an analogy of um, like a, a big screen TV. You know, in the earlier days, the number of pixels that we had were limited by the technology. And as we got to the higher definition TVs, that means you're bringing more pixels into the frame. And as you brought more pixels into the frame, your image was sharper. You could see um, with greater clarity. That's what I would say we're getting with system security engineering and an SC approach. You certainly can do continuous monitoring as we're doing it now. And it's a good thing to do. We've made incredible strides. And with new technologies, scanning technologies, and with the new um, machine learning and artificial intelligence where we're able to bring that greater capability, that's all well and good. But just think about a world where you had an engineering-based uh, production process on the bottom level of all those components and you were actually making those components uh, better. Uh, fewer weaknesses and deficiencies which translate to fewer vulnerabilities. The better job you do below the waterline of building good component products and doing a good job of building those, com bringing those components together for the capability through a disciplined engineering process, you're basically giving the consumers above the waterline fewer things to worry about. 
So that's, that's the first point I would make. The second point, below the water line, there is an opportunity for continuous monitoring as well. If you look at some of the new work in zero trust architectures, for example, where we're taking that, that large perimeter, which we used to try to defend completely, and now we're assuming the adversaries are inside the house, we're collapsing that perimeter to smaller and smaller resources. So instead of just asking for your identity at the front door, every time you try to access a resource within the system, we're doing identity management, authorization, access control, and continuous monitoring in real time. So it's, it's really not an either or, it's, I look at it as a combination of continue to do what we're doing above the waterline with continuous monitoring supplement that with some of the new work going on in the zero trust architecture area and the engineering process actually has a lot of continuous monitoring built into it because our life cycle doesn't stop when that widget rolls off the line or that system goes operational. There are, there, there's operational aspects and once those systems go into operation like a weapon system or in a power plant, you're getting feedback in near real time or real time on how that system is operating. If you discover a flaw or a weakness that becomes a vulnerability, you report back to the design team and they try to articulate and build a fix for that problem. So it's, it's never one and done in the world of engineering. It's, it's continuing going back to those life cycle steps and continuing to take new information and, and making the, the system and the products better as you go forward. Understood, thank you. I would like to spend a couple of minutes if we could talking about cyber resiliency. You mentioned it previously and I know it's kind of the focus of volume two of 800-160. I thought maybe I'd ask if you could discuss what the, you know, the guidance in 860 volume two focuses on relative to cyber resiliency and maybe what kind of systems does it apply to? Is it traditional IT systems? Is it OT systems? Is it, you know, what we think of the internet of things? Is it, it you know, maybe you could speak to that for a moment if you would. Sure. Well, both volumes uh, in 860 volume one and volume two they, they literally can be applied to any type of system. Uh, we learned a long time ago that it was foolish to focus on IT systems, enterprises. That's where we started in all the business a long time ago. But the reality is very quickly, computers were making their way out to everything. It, they, they've been OT worlds forever. Uh, the, uh, a lot of the work on the OT side was driven by analog uh, type technology, which has migrated toward digital technology, which brings everything back into play. IOT devices, again, those are driven by computers. They may be small form factor, but you still have the same computing technology driving those kind of devices. So the technology makes no difference. It's, it's the process you use in going through that discipline life cycle process to achieve the outcome. So that's the first thing I would say about uh, the world of IOT. And what was the second part of your question? I think you were asking. I, yeah, just trying to maybe encapsulate what the cyber resiliency is focused oh, on. Resilience. Yeah, so once we finish volume one, now you, you take a step back and you say, well, if you were to survey the federal government and probably the private sector as well, I would say 95% or more of the systems out there, they're not in the design phase of development. Those are operational systems, installed based legacy systems. So we said, okay, we have a near we have a real-time problem now. We can't wait for every system uh, to be ripped apart uh, and replaced. So in volume two, that guidance on cyber resiliency can be applied either to new development systems or they can be applied to legacy systems, IT systems, OT, IOT, it doesn't make any difference. The idea with cyber resilience, and again, cyber resilience is a subset of what we call system resilience. But it, just to, to, to make a long story short, uh, the, I look at resilience as kind of like the human body. You know, we're, every day we're out there in, in the environment, we're picking up germs and viruses, and we have an immune system. So when we come in contact with those viruses and, and those uh, bacteria out there, most of the time our immune system does a pretty good job of handling that. Now, at some point, you know, you might get unlucky and you could get cancer or we had COVID-19 and that, that takes a, a greater toll. Some of those things are strong and the, the immune system gets overwhelmed. But in general, the immune system does a great job. So I would, you could think of volume two as kind of like guidance for helping your system, your computer system act more like the human body. We make an assumption in chapter one that the adversary has already found a way into your system. That's, that's day one, we assume that happened. 
The idea then is what can you do to make their life miserable once they're inside? Um, we, we have a couple of different, I, I try to explain it in two different dimensions. Adversaries have to, uh, they, they come in and then they try to move laterally, uh, either through your system to find the target of opportunity, whether it's a payload they're looking for or something, some valuable asset, exfiltration, bringing down your capability, uh, installing new vulnerabilities. They also would like to use your system as a platform to launch to get to other systems. We've seen that a lot, especially in the past couple of years with some very serious breaches in the supply chain. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is time on target. Adversaries go through what we call a kill chain, and they have to execute every step in that kill chain. And anytime you can disrupt the kill chain, at any point, you stop the attack. So with those two things in mind, what kinds of technologies and things can we bring forward, safeguards and cyber resiliency techniques and approaches that can help us achieve those two goals? If you were to look at, for example, the uh, we're trying to increase the work factor. So in the zero trust architecture where you're bringing those safeguards like uh, identity management, access control, authorization to smaller and smaller resources, you're making it very difficult for the adversary. You're increasing the work factor. And that takes more time, more energy, more resources. At some point, they give up, and they go somewhere else. And that's applied across the entire system. It's The analogy I use is your, your house. You have a lock on your front door. Bad guys can get through the lock on the front door. Once they're in your house, are they looking at every room being unlocked and all your valuables in every room? Or what if you had a, a safe or a vault in every room? Well, that's a totally different story. That's like a security domain in every room in your house. Now you're increasing their work factor. We also have the ability now through our new technologies to do virtualization and things like that and micro virtualization, which means you refresh software components very quickly. So if there happens to be malicious code in your system, if you're refreshing that code often enough, you can, you can limit the adversary's time on target. Um, also, segmentation is very important, and micro-segmentation, breaking up your network into smaller and smaller pieces that can apply those uh, zero-trust concepts. It, it, so you kind of, those two things together are two different uh, approaches to try to give us what we call cyber resiliency. Basically, it means that you can take a punch and you're not going down for the count. The system continues to operate even if it's in a degraded or a debilitated state. You withstand the attack, you try to adapt, and you try to survive for one more day while you're trying to do things that make that system uh, even more survivable. That's what really 8160 Volume 2 is all about. And we have very detailed um, goals, objectives, techniques, and approaches that, can, that are linked to our security controls and the MITRE attack framework, which brings all of the threat space into play. So this isn't just shelfware, this is actual real world things you can go to. And for legacy systems, uh, the, I remember an army general once said, you go, to, you go to war with the army you have, not the army you want. So volume two is about going to battle with the adversaries today with the system that you have. And there are lots and lots of things we can do uh, as volume two describes, uh, discusses that can show you how to make that system more cyber resilient. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Ross. So we're very quickly running out of time. Um, the, the last question I wanted to ask was, how can viewers of the show learn more about the work coming from NIST? Is there a website where they can learn more about your particular work? Yes, sir, there is. Uh, we, all of our website uh, information is on uh, csrc.nist.gov. And when you go to that website, it is very well laid out in different categories. You can find risk management, crypto work, you can find all the things we talked about today in the engineering world, and all of our publications, by the way, are, are downloadable and in PDF format, and, and a lot of our control catalog work now is being uh, placed on our website in various formats, so tool makers can download and ingest that information directly into tools. Um, those publications are all free of charge. Um, well, I shouldn't really say free. You, you all uh, are our bosses out there. Uh, you pay my salary and you paid for this work uh, many times over. So we encourage everyone out there to, um, number one, use the stuff that we've developed in a way that works for you and helps you make your system and your organization more secure. 
And if you have any questions or, or problems that you, you can't uh, quite solve, uh, give us a call, send us email, and we'll be happy to uh, try to answer your questions for you. And we, we just appreciate uh, you doing this today, Jim, and, and thanks very much for the time. So Dr. Ross, we are out of time. We really appreciate you coming on Cybersecurity Today and sharing your expertise. Thanks, Jim. It was great to be here with you today again. So that concludes the second part of our series on system security engineering and cyber resiliency. We hope that you found this discussion insightful. A special thanks again to Dr. Ron Ross for sharing his expertise with us. Now, for more information and updates on upcoming episodes, please visit our website at www.cybersecuritytoday.org. We look forward to having you with us at our next episode. Until then, take care. Thanks again.